And thank you everyone uh, for joining us. We are just going to have an awesome hour of talking esports and academics. Uh, and I'm the host, uh, Katrina Adkins. Um, just a little bit about me. I've been in education oh, over 20 years, actually started as a kindergarten teacher. And in all honesty, I thought that's what I was going to do forever. Uh, my mom taught kindergarten for over 30 years. My aunt taught first grade. And for as uh, long as I could remember, that's what I wanted to do. And so uh, it quickly turned into wanting to get more and more involved with technology. And so moved into uh, teaching a few other different grade levels, uh, then into K-5 uh, computers, into sixth and ninth computer science, uh, nine through 12 computer science. Uh, and I actually continue to still teach uh, and teach college at a number of different universities online, teach gaming and esports. So uh, really happy to still have my foot in the door and still get to work with students. So I am now with a company called the USAEL, United States Academic Esports League. And and just super excited to talk with these experts that we have on here today to talk esports. And so I suspect that we have folks on here who are brand new to esports all the way up to you probably already have esports in your school. And that's okay because we're going to have a wide variety of things that we're going to talk about today. Um, and I think everybody will have kind of a piece of that and uh, be interested in all those areas. So to start us out, uh, I would like to introduce our panelists, starting with uh, Christopher Turner. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me, Katrina. Um, yeah. So, so I guess I'll go through the gamut. Of, uh, I've been in education right now for right at 15 years. I uh, started out uh, in K-12 as a graphic and visual arts teacher, uh, oddly enough. Um, transitioned through a few schools, uh, landed on Southern University. Uh, Southern University is located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's an HBCU. It's the only HBCU system in the country. Uh, so that afforded me a bigger and broader net. On the Baton Rouge landmass, we have a pre-K through 12th grade school uh, that are founded and started a program there and launched a room. Um, and then we have an undergraduate, we have a law center, and we have an ag center. Um, now I'm the director over the Mixed Reality Institute, um, Virtual Innovation, Gaming and Esports Institute, I'm sorry, at Southern University Law Center. Um, where we uh, we expose underrepresented communities to those uh, said titles within uh, within the title of the institute uh, through research programming and uh, coursework. Love it. Thank you so much. Uh, and then next up, we have Dr. Robbins. Great to see you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. And it's awesome to see you and awesome to finally meet and hear from Christopher. I've been following him for a while on social media. So uh, I'm in the presence of greatness today. I'm really happy to be here and really honored that you thought of us. So um, this beautiful community behind me is the Brigantine community located right outside of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, we are a pre-K to eight district. And um, you know, similar to the Chris, I did start out in the uh, education field as a teacher. Uh, the high school level, and then moved on up to different administrative ranks, and then had the pleasure and the honor of being the superintendent here for the last three going on four years here at Brigantine. And, um, you know, for us, we created an esports team in the the height of the pandemic of the lockdown, when we saw all the kids talking for the first time, you know, really conversing. And we said, why can't we do something like that? So we we went virtual for a while, and then we said, let's build something amazing for them. And we've done so. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into the conversation. But um, really, like I said, really excited, honored to be here and represent Brigantine and talk about all the great things we're doing for the, the uh, K-8 kids here. I love that. Your students are so lucky to have you, that's for sure. And I love that you brought up the, the social media uh, factor because that's how I met both of you years ago on yeah. social media. And I'll tell you, some of my best friends I have met online and the fun part about going to conferences is we always you know get to see one another so it's great to share this time with both of you today and talk about you know one of our favorite topics which is esports and so um i want to start out with a question and, and i'll pose this to to both of you and we'll actually we'll start with chris but um what is all the hype about you know why 
elementary or and middle and high school esports? Why are we bringing esports to K twelve students? What is mm -hmm. all this hype? I think it's a uh, you know I think it's college and career pathways. I think it's meeting the students where they are, and you know I, I think at this point in time, you know uh, us as peers and people that deal with the esports every every day, uh, we we stick to those three, uh, and it just makes sense. Uh, and, and meeting the students where they are, you know, you got to understand they gain. Um, I tell people all the time that we're probably one generation from the whole household being gamers, because uh, definitely everybody that's on this panel and, you know, are gamers of some sort. And so, you know, and, and you know, focusing on the college and career pathways, if you think about it, everything is going technical, technology is moving at an extreme rate. Uh, you know, especially with, you know, AI and the metaverse and VR and mixed reality, everything like that. So, you know, um, you know, education as we, as we know it is changing. And so if we're going to keep the, the students engaged, if we're going to have them, you know, at bay to, to listen and learn, you have to meet them where they are, point blank, period. I love that. The thought of meeting students where they are. And of course, that looks different year after year. I mean, especially, you know, moving through uh, education as, as the three of us have done, um, that has changed over the years. So, you know, uh, Glenn, what do you think? You know, what up in New Jersey, what's all the hype with esports? What's going on there in uh, Brigantine? Yeah, so I think, you know, Chris really explained it very, very well. Um, you know, for us, it's younger kids and they, they play video games. And like we said, when the pandemic really happened, it was really exposed to who all the gamers truly were. And even if you weren't a gamer, now you you jumped on because it was a way to talk to your, your neighbor that you usually play the street with, whatever it may be. And then it's evolved. Um, but for us, you know, we started seeing like this interconnectivity of these kids. Like we're always saying, well, they're, they're on the phone, they're not talking to each other. Well, they're talking to each other more than we ever did face to face. So I think that's part of the big hype is seeing those social skills being developed over that time. Um, I'm seeing the sports aspect of it being developed. I'm seeing the sportsmanship act, act being developed about it. Um, and then going all the way up to the collegiality ranks that Chris had mentioned where he's at and so forth. It, it's it's rather impressive when you look at his resume and talks about, you know, the law school aspect of what esports is. Um, you know, so when parents always say, you know, oh, you stop playing video games or it's just a video game thing. Now I can mention, hey, you know, I was on a panel with a gentleman who works at a university that does law about esports, and that's just getting started. But, you know, like you see, and we can say it a bunch of times, when esports comes on TV, it is the most watched sporting event on TV, except for the Super Bowl. Um, that's really impressive. And, you know, when we were trying to develop the, the our esports arena, it took a while because everything was on back order because the whole world wanted mm -hmm. to buy video game consoles or some type of technology device that utilized chips and or pieces in that technology that were back ordered and so forth. So um, it's there. I think it's been there. Uh, to Chris's part, the, the families are gamers. Yeah. Whether you started out with the old Commodore 64 or the Atari or, you know, the, the, the Nintendo, um, there's always been some type of piece of getting involved to be maybe away from yourself for a while. Maybe it's part of meditation. Maybe it's just to be a different person for a while and, take a mental break from our world that we're in in two. I love that. I, I was actually going to uh, age ourselves here and ask what your first uh, gaming <laughs> council was. You know, I'm not afraid. Mine was Atari. I got, you know, Pac-Man, Frogger, you know, I, I'm old. But, um, you know, what What do you remember from growing up, Chris? Um, definitely snuck. In. So I have a brother that's seven years older than me. Definitely wow. snuck on his Atari. Um, <laughs> My my personal like first system was the the first Nintendo though uh, that I didn't have to share with my older brother. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah I had that older sister, so yeah. I understand yeah. that word snuck. You had to you know sneak to yeah. use it. I get it. I get it. Glenn, what about you? Uh, we had the Atari, and then we moved up to the Nintendo, and uh, mm. love that. I had a younger brother, uh, <laughs> eighteen months younger than me. So, but I remember you know the duck mm. hunt. Power pad, the, the, yeah. the you know running the track meet on the uh, on the pad itself. But yeah. I remember just like I said, fun days that you could have inside the house on bad weather days. Um, I always enjoyed being out of the house. My brother played video games like there was no tomorrow, and he beat the Nintendo games in three or four days. 
So, you know, it, it's always been something that we could take elsewhere too. That was kind of cool for the first time. We could take it, you know, to our grandparents' house or take it down the shore or take it wherever it may be. So, but it's kind of comical to really date ourselves. I put one up, uh, the old Nintendo <laughs> up in my uh, garage and we were playing it with my neighbor, who's also my age. And my son came in, this is a few years ago. My son and his kids came in and said, why is the game all glitchy? <laughs> And we're like, dude, you the don't even understand how high tech this is, or like, <laughs> you know, ice hockey, you know, and so forth. So uh, it's it's come a long way, but we definitely did it ourselves, Katrina. <laughs> I know, I know. And it's so funny you you say about you know being glitchy. It's so funny that this big draw now is is Minecraft. You know, when you when you talk pixelation Brain and those types of things, yeah. I was blown away when Minecraft first came out. Like, what is the draw yeah. to this? But you know, it's it's interesting. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. So I would love to uh, move on to another question here. And for this question, I am going to share with the audience a picture because I would like to know what you see in this picture. What do you suspect is happening? And what are some things that you notice? We'll, we'll jump back over to Chris here to start. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first esports event that ever sure took place. Is. I'm not going to say what date, where they were. I'm going to let the audience uh, go look that up right quick. Uh, but, I mean, that's, it's it's a dated picture, uh, but it's it's the same. Uh, the only thing you're missing is the main stage uh, that you see in some arenas and some uh, colleges now. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of the labs, like in high school and middle schools, and even you know now elementary schools are pretty much the same. It's a, it's a screen, tables, and a system or a PC, and you have spectator seats. Uh, and I I would guess you know the 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 ones that are standing behind are the tournament organizers, uh, keeping score, keeping bracket, that type of thing. But this this picture says a lot. What do you see, Glenn? Uh, very much the same with Christie's, but I also see a lot different nowadays compared to what our gamers are now. Like, you know, the individuals playing, you know, we have an extremely diverse um, clientele and team and population in our district. And I'm looking at this and I don't see anyone of color, anyone of female, yeah. um, you know, and I don't know what they're, you know, um, emotional intelligence are, their IQs are, but for us, it doesn't matter what you look like, who you are, what you like, whatever. If you can game, you game and then you work together. So, yeah. but, you know, to Chris's point, you know, you see kids here in front of these screens and, you know, there is a big fan base behind them. Um, you know, I look at this and I also think of the old movie Pixels, you know, that came out with Adam Sandler when they were playing the, the retro and they're sitting at the space, like, so... <laughs> Definitely you know, Atari's. So, they are, they are. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny you mentioned that, Glenn, because that was one of the first things I noticed. Like, where are the girls? Are the I girls don't see girls? any. Uh, you know, and and that is something that that we still kind of struggle with today. And I think for a number of different reasons, but, you know, getting females involved and, and it's something that of course, uh, you know, as a female that I, I definitely pay attention to and um, want to make sure that we get more and more females involved with, with esports, with STEM in general, with CTE, those areas. So um, I wonder if you look straight in the middle, there's an older gentleman and I wonder if that maybe is a professor or a teacher or something. And, you know, it's, it's, it could be like, you know, one of you, the, the, the star teacher that saw the benefits in this, you know, or saw, saw that this could bring something to, to students. And, you know, I don't know, it, you can, you know, guess on all this stuff, but it makes me wonder. So uh, a lot of times people ask me, you know, how do, how do I find an esports coach for my program? And, and I often say, honestly, you don't even really need somebody who knows all there is to know about games. Just if you have somebody that cares about kids and understands the vision, you know. So ha has that been a struggle kind of in, in the collegiate space at all, Chris, uh, in terms of, of coaching? And how do you, um, you know, how do you go about finding coaches? And Yeah, I think, I, think it, yeah, I think in collegiate, we're in that development space where you have programs that are really competitive, like 
that's that's the epic center of that program is competitive. Uh, and then on the other side of it, you have programs that lean more towards a, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, making sure females uh, have a place, uh, you know, people of color, different races. Um, and it's more of a community-based program. Uh, and you might have uh, programs that are student-led that pretty much don't have coaches uh, at this point in time, because like I said, we're still in development. So those are the three programs that, that I see uh, like repetitive. Uh, I think we're, we're at a spot where, you know, in the next few years, you know, the, the, the students that I'm teaching right now are probably going to graduate, you know, in the next, you know, one to two years, they're probably going to want to come back to say colleges and I'm, I'm starting to see it already. And be you know assistant directors are esports coaches in said games, um, and I think <clears throat> from the standpoint of just competitive you know esports being competitive video gaming, I'll say this and, and pass, pass it along. Um, we're we're at a space now where you know the deans and chancellors and presidents still really don't understand it fully to the point where they can say, okay, so Chris, you're you're a director. Um, but it's almost like being an athletic director because Fortnite could be football, Rocket League could be basketball. And so it's different disciplines and different meta and different strategies that I might not have the time to keep up with and coach each individual team. Uh, it's, it's that hectic when you, when you really focus on competitive, you know, at a college level. And, you know, um, you know, like I said earlier, you know, I'm only what a year out of K through 12, and so um, even even seeing in, in that in that facet, you have educators that are passionate about esports to see those college and career pathways and see what Glenn was talking about earlier as far as you know your social emotional learning and you know uh, your soft and hard skills that you learn in any other sport right or any other club you you're getting you're getting that within those gaming or esports clubs and so. Um, you know, finding a teacher that is just passionate about students, not necessarily being able to coach, uh, is really important to keep that those programming uh, programs thriving. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and I'm I'm glad you came back. You know, circled back around to that social emotional learning because, you know, one of the the barriers to entry, I think, uh, for K twelve esports is you know, everybody in the district having an understanding of the benefits of it and of, you know, the social emotional learning benefits of it. And I so often hear, you know, oh, my superintendent, they, they just doesn't get it. Or, you know, my principal just doesn't see, uh, you know, or understand, or the parents don't see or understand. And, you know, and there's so much conversation too around, you know, kids aren't social anymore. Well, they are, they're, they're they social are. in a different way now. It's just different. Uh, yeah. It is. And so, you know, that kind of makes me wonder, you know, Glenn, as a superintendent um, and leading the charge for esports, I mean, your your district is so lucky to have this leader that sees and, you know, you saw the vision uh, for esports and what it could bring to students. And so, you know, what would you say if there's folks on here that are, are brand new to esports, you know, where do they start? You know, what, what should they think about first and, and maybe how can esports enhance their academic environments that they have right now? That's a really great question. And I'm going to be honest, it's not an easy push. Um, you know, it depends on where you are. You know, I have some friends that work in some incredible school districts, but they're, you know, ultra traditional because it's been successful for years. So why are we going to change that? I think it's like anything else. It's how you sell it, and it's your vision and what's your passion to it and so forth. So uh, for us, it's having the conversation with the board. You know, the board represents the constituents in the, new, in the community. And it's, you know, you've already had the conversation with the kids. You've already, you know, they want to play. So the next part is having that conversation with the board and getting their input. What are their concerns? You know, what, and expressing, expressing to them what benefits are going to come out of this? And Chris touched on a lot of that. You know, what are all the new uh, career paths that are coming out of this per uh, of esports, and what can it continue to develop? Then it's like, all right, are you going to, you know, it's like building a brand new football stadium or a brand new soccer field. Are you going to make it actually a real regulation size field, 
and then compare that to the esports. Are you just putting it in a room in the corner that hasn't been used for years and you're going to get a bunch of old computers or whatever it may be? Or are you going to truly invest in these kids and make a spot for them? You know, if we're talking about all means all and all conclusivity, then, you know, just giving them a room doesn't do enough. You really got to push yeah. into that, that. You support them and you love them and you want the best for them because ultimately that's what's going to grow the program. You know, it's like anything else. You play on a, a really bad football field or whatever it may be. There's no pride to that. There's no, you know, building of tradition to that. So for us to you know, my recommendation is to have those conversations with your board members, but you've already had to do the homework. You already have to have your vision in place where you're going to go. You know, talk about the league you're going to join. It's not just playing. It's whatever it may be. Uh, the league for us, we use Garden State League, which has been wonderful for individuals to put this together. Um, two, <laughs> a great friend of mine that leads this, as I'm sure as well as both of you. But it really helps walk the coaches through it. and it gives guide sheets and so forth about what can they play? What, you know, is it all violence? No. And then you talk about the team building, you talk about the sportsmanship, you talk about the social emotional aspect, giving kids a place to go that he or she may have never been on a team before. You know, so for me, when I'm seeing this, and you talked about the coaches earlier, you know, you're going to push the emphasis that you're going to get a coach that's going to teach people to work together. You watch some gamers, they get furious and they'll throw their controller or they start talking smack. Look, how many times has a school administrator had to deal with something that happened on social media and or a video game that comes into school the next day because someone threatened somebody or said something they shouldn't have said? Now you're getting ahead of that curve saying, hey, we're going to teach these kids how to actually properly talk to one another on a team instead of, you know, just talking smack and then really getting into situations that you shouldn't get into become cyber harassment and bullying and all those other awful things that happen in the world. So for us, it was pushing on that, the cyber awareness and so forth. And then we talked about, hey, let's tie this into CTE more. You know, how about we buy computers that we can take apart and put back together? And the kids have to do that. So when a video, you know, car goes, it's getting older or whatever it may be, the kids have to now do the hands-on hardware, not just the software. So it's teaching them soft, it's teaching them the software, the hardware, teaching them teamwork, mm -hmm. it's teaching them so many great things. But ultimately, if you're going to invest into this, do it right. You know, um, if you go halfway, the kids are going to go halfway. The kid is not going to last. It's not going to be built something that they need to be. And for us, we created such a safe haven space for regardless of who you are as an individual. They just want to be there at a game and be with their friends and have an opportunity to be like any other kid. Be trust, believed in, respected, and represent the school in a whole nother way that they've never had a chance to do. I absolutely love it. Uh, it's so uh, heartwarming just to hear you talk about it. And in all honesty, you know, we could almost separate out all those pieces and have a, you know, a multi-day conversation <laughs> <laughs> around all of those pieces because, you know, it is tough. You know, how do you, how do you decide what hardware, how do you find a space within your district to, you know, house their field to play on? I always say that, you know, why, why do the basketball players or the football players get a field or a court and, you know, there's not a place for, for our esports students. Um, so, you know, I love all these pieces uh, to the puzzle. So, you know, I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole here, and you all will know what I'm meaning as soon as I bring this up, but you mentioned leagues, and how do I, yeah, yeah, how do I, you know, that you're a part of Garden State, and uh, Garden State Esports is amazing, and so, um, you know, the word, though, that you use that I want to emphasize is support and how Garden State Esports support you. And so how does someone kind of sift through everything, all this movement going on in academic esports, how does someone sift through and, and find the right place to be? Uh, Chris, what do you think about that? Yeah, stay off of social media and do your research yourself. Um, <laughs> everybody has strong opinions. Uh, some are valid, some are not, um, but it's a lot of noise. And so, you know, uh, not not trying to call any leagues out or, or down top leagues, but you know, um, I'm I'm a fan of support. I'm a fan of community leagues. I'm a fan of uh, putting students first. Uh, where it could benefit the students, I'm all for it. Um, you know, if you want to get strongly competitive and you want to go through, you know, uh, um, 
you know, a bracket, a regional bracket, then do nationals. Uh, nine times out of 10, you're going to have to pay for that. And Ben could probably tell you how much uh, from a district budget, what, what that looks like. Uh, per school, it might not look that bad, but when you're talking about district dollars, it's, it's a lot. You know, it's a lot to for, for a district or a school to pay for that. It's a lot for uh, parents to pay for that. Uh, because I mean, like I said before, we're still in the in a stage of development where we have many leads out here, and you're gonna have to do your research. You're gonna have to make sure that you're advocating for the students, and everything that's shiny is not good. It's not not golden, and um, you know, I, I just strongly believe in you know student center programs and student center leads, where you know the kids are taken away. So something from it and not just saying, hey, I got a trophy and it only cost me a hundred bucks uh, or whatever the fee is. Uh, but when you can bring in industry partners and you can give them, you know, scholarships and internships and you can give them life experiences uh, that Glenn has talked about strongly about, um, that's a win-win for everybody. Uh, and I'll, I'll pass it to, to Glenn on this one. mute myself. I had some noise going on in the background. Mm -hmm. going on. I, I don't know, Katrina, what do you think? How, where do you want me to dive into more? Like with the well, pop and so forth? Yeah. So you know, you know, what what I collectively hear are a lot of different things and and not to necessarily focus on the hardware, the the bling, the shiny object that's out there, right? And so that takes me kind of to actually to what to next question. Um, you know, how do we look beyond the competition, beyond the game, all the things that are happening behind the scenes that are so amazing for students and 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 often forgotten uh, when schools go to start an esports program, a sustainable esports program. And so, two of those areas uh, that I kind of want to focus in on are curriculum and careers. And you know, why should we care about those? And and we can kind of tag on that lead conversation if you want to. Um, you know, when doing research to be looking beyond just that competition. So let's first talk about, you know, a little bit about curriculum. And Glenn, how are you bringing uh, esports curriculum or even STEM CTE, these areas into the school day or after school? Or how do you how do you kind of um, operate within Bernie Team? Yeah, that's a great question. So we just opened the arena this year uh, after being virtual for two years or a year and a half. So we have dead, you know, how do we get kids involved in here? And the coach that we hired has been fantastic. He's a coach of crew uh, at our school as well. So he already had the coaching experience and that way he knew about recruiting. He knew about, you know, getting kids involved and so forth. So he would do is open it up during one of our flex periods that we have called Buccaneer time. So if anybody didn't want to go outside for recess, they could go in there and play. Um, and then it was like a recruiting process. And then uh, from there, he's also mathematics. So he's going to start tying in, the, you know, the esports and, you know, the, the gaming aspect into the mathematics curriculum and so forth. And we're starting to build on that. We're very young in that. I'm not going to be uh, telling you any lies, but very young in regards to where we're going to go with this. Um, but, you know, like I said, the, the things that go on behind the scenes, you know, we had kids that picked out the uniforms. They designed it. And then they put it together. They went online. They found the site that could do that with them, went back to the coach and said, can we buy these? And this is what we're going to do. So then they all got their uniforms. And then it was like, all right, how do we design the arena? You know, same thing when we sat down with the vendors and so forth. And we said, like, all right, how do we build this? What does it look like? Yes or no? Do you guys like this? And then it was the mascot. You know, we're the Buccaneers, but the kids wanted to be called the Megalodons. You know, so to me, from the administrative point, like, all right, guys, all of our merchandising is in a is a Buccaneer pirate. Now you're going to go to a Megalodon, and they explained it to me, and they're like, we're just going to eat the competition. I was like, all right, you guys have me at Megalodon. We're a beach community. That's awesome. And then they want to change their colors because they want to go red and black, and we're a blue and white school. You know, once again, I asked them why, and they said, that's our avatar. This is who we are. So think about that for a minute. You know, when we play video games or you're in a social media world, how many fake burner social media things that people have and how many avatars do people have? Um, so, you know, you blend it in and then obviously the gaming will continue to blend into all the academics as we continue to build on that. 
Um, but and then you know we tied it into art. We had two of the girls that were on the team last year were the big time artists. They started painting in and coloring the exterior of the arena because they call it the abyss, and that's where everybody's going to get lost in the abyss. Um, they started painting all water features around the exterior of the room as well. So we tied in the art teachers as well. So. Like I said, we're just getting started on that. And to Chris's level, a whole nother level of what he's doing. So I definitely want to hear more about that. Yeah, I agree, Chris. I would love to hear kind of how does this, you know, extend into uh, the collegiate space? Yeah, it, it, it extends. It, it reaches every degree probably on campus. Um, so um, we just launched our room last year. Um, well, we did a ribbon cutting. We're actually going to fully launch in August. Uh, but we've been having programming ever since uh, March of this year. Um, and thank, thank God for having uh, leadership in my chancellor and vice chancellor um, and having some funds from COVID. Uh, we, we did a half a million dollar loan. And so um, everything from the production equipment that we have, you know, being able to tie into MassCom, um, you know, being able to do lunch and learns in the space and lectures, um, not only you know from a, from the gaming perspective, but those are transformational skills that you are able to uh, go into different industries with. And you know, in esports, we call it shoutcasting, but I mean it's commentary. You know, you're commentating yourself. You know, even that skill set um, again, touch a mass comma, even you know, getting with our nursing department and showing them. You know, these are the stretches that we're doing to to not get fatigued and not strain hands and muscles. And I mean, I can go on for days how much gaming esports touches everything. And, you know, to Glenn's point, you know, picking out the right computers, you know, we're able to do accelerators, you know, as far as game development and, you know, um, different programming um, that we can do within that room because we do have the technology in there, you know, or having, you know, VR and metaverse, uh, type curriculum. Um, and, and at the Law Center, we just launched the first ever uh, esports and law certification. And, uh, you know, I think my chance and vice chance would be mad if I didn't stress how important law is within the facet of, of not only this industry, but every industry. And um, like I said, we're still, you know, in that honeymoon phase as far as esports is concerned. And so it's going to be some laws change. It's going to be some legal acts change. Uh, definitely probably in the near future, but, you know, you need to know what a trademark is and what a copyright is. And, you know, we have a, a SULC technology center uh, that one of my, you know, coworkers, uh, she, she runs that department. And so we're already talking about, you know, what, what does a curriculum look like for streaming music a lot um, and doing a cohort of students and pretty much putting them through the phase of, you know, starting your LLC making sure you get, you know, your, your name and rights and trademarks and copyrights and how do you fully develop yourself to go to the marketplace. And so, um, yeah, I'm just fortunate and blessed enough to be in an environment. I think Katrina knows better than Glenn, but it's it's been a mountain climb to be in a position now where we can really just create uh, and service the community and service the students and like educate the full community and not just uh, the students that we have on the college campus. Yeah, I just want to add to that, Katrina, too. Like, it's just thinking about what Chris is talking about, the laws and so forth, with the exponential changes that are coming, right? With, you, with all the gamers, you have multiple streaming services and so forth. Like, we use Twitch. That was a whole new revolution to teach people here and so forth. But talking about the copyrights, trade rights, and so forth, when you put certain things up on there. Um, and then artificial intelligence in itself. Like, it, it's, you know, so many things are already outdated within a day. So to be able to keep up with all these different things and then come back from the district side and say, are we in compliance legally, policy-wise, you know, what we're trying to do. So um, thanks, Chris, for sharing that, because it definitely yeah, goes no problem. behind the scenes with those in, yeah. in things that you just mentioned. Yeah. I mean, e even down to like, you know, us having a room now and like, like I've been stressing, you know, it's not just for our, our college community, but it's for the community outside of the walls. Even now to us being careful about when we have a certain age range in the building getting, you know, media release forms because they're going live out to the world. And so, uh, and, you know, Twitch and YouTube, you have age restrictions about who can stream and who can't. 
And so knowing knowing all of that legality is really important. Um, and I think we just overlook look at it. We just check the box and we're signing my lives away and everything else. Um, but we're just so used to just clicking that box and just going for it that we really don't think about second thoughts uh, about what can happen uh, and what can be shut down or what can be flagged as content that you can't monetize. And that's another thing, you know, as far as K through 12 and collegiate, we got a, we got a real chance in monetizing the brand uh, to benefit your program. Um, and I think people are not really thinking about that long-term either. Yeah, absolutely. This also makes me think, um, you know, for those that are maybe starting a program or, you know, have, have started one or started one during the pandemic, it takes, I mean, it takes the whole community to get this going. Like you said, Glenn, it's not just this small thing. Um, and so one of the teams that, you know, definitely can't be you know, pushed out or sit in a silo is the IT team. I see. And <laughs> yeah, huge. I mean, you know, I've seen so many teams that, you know, they go to start and then they, well, wait a minute, everything's blocked or, you know, wait a minute, yeah. uh, we don't have access to this. And so, you know, what, what kind of advice do you have for kind of wrangling up all these different departments and, and making sure that, you know, everyone is talking to everyone and has a complete understanding? What, what do you think about that, Glenn? Well, if your IT person is not your right and left hand right now in today's society, uh, I don't know what you're truly doing because um, it no longer is ed tech separate. It is a <laughs> commodity each and every day. So for me, you know, and your great points, Katrina, we've seen this, but when we when building went one to one, you know, they wanted to go one to one and they didn't have the, you know, the, the capacity to do it because they never ran it past the, the IT department and they get all these computers delivered and they're like, we're not going to be able to turn all these things on. They're all not going to be able to work. They're not going to have connectivity and so forth. So you need to have those extensive conversations well in advance with your mm -hmm. IT department as well as everybody else, as I mentioned. But you know, you got to make sure you have all the access points to servers, the broadband, and everything else that goes into the building. And then is that you talked about sustainability? Can you sustain that? You know, how long is that going to go before you need to replace all those things? Do you have a plan in place for every three, two, one, five, how many years you have, you know, to start replacing these as things continue to go on? Um, you know, the, you talk, you know, Chris mentioned about the computers. You know, that's one of the reasons why we went with the brand that we went to take them apart and put them back together because it helps with sustainability. I can't buy mega machinery mm -hmm. that is amazing that my kid wants at home that I can't even afford that, you know, to, to refurbish them or redo them every three or four years. It's literally impossible on a school budget. So um, your IT person needs to be every step of the way in that conversation. And like I said, that started with laptops, that started with the esports, and now it didn't even start with the AI because it's going to be more and more infused going forward into all of our conversations, whether it's policy, whether it's academics, whether it's anything that goes on in your school district. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for that advice. Um, one group that we have not really touched on yet is something that we all have in common, parents. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is, I know for, for my two, I now have a 19-year-old son, a 17-year-old daughter who have been gamers since forever. Um, in fact, I used to drag them around to conferences with me. They did presentations on Minecraft and all kinds of different stuff. And so it was just something that I always supported. And I saw, you know, the the, the social aspects of it. I saw what it could, could bring to their lives. And so, but that's not always the case. And so, you know, Chris, you mentioned, um, you know, talking even uh, outside of the university and outside of the schools into the community. And I know that involves parents. So how do you have those conversations, those tough conversations, especially for those who don't see the vision and don't see what esports can bring? I mean, you have to have that, that tough conversation. I mean, uh, uh, going, going even back, you know, I, I get asked this question a lot in training. When I was, in, you know, at the at the pre-K through 12th grade school, and, and trust me, we, we got great coverage, right? We, we did great things uh, for students. But one of the questions I get asked all the time is, what would you have did different? Um, I would have had parent nights. I would have had educational nights for parents. 
I would have brought in speakers for parents to educate them on, you know, what the possibilities are. Um, and, I, and I guess in my new role, you know, I'm looking at that in a whole different way. So, you know, how do you invite the parents into, into that arena that man built? Um, and how do you educate them? Because, I mean, think about it. They're probably around our age. And so they're thinking Nintendo. They're thinking, you know, Atari. They're thinking, oh, it's just a video game. It's counterproductive. They don't, they don't see the connectivity to the career paths. And, you know, to be honest, you know, you're talking about careers, and, and we all know on this, on this panel, um, you're talking about careers that that need people right now, and you're talking about six-figure jobs, and they can't find a talent. And so, um, you know, especially with the, the insurgent of these programs, you know, you're talking about something that can they can easily get into. Uh, and, you know, it won't be, uh, you know, a, a few thousand resumes. It might be only 100. And that makes a big difference uh, when you're talking about sustainability. And so when you start having those type of conversations with, you know, with parents and exposing them to the possibilities, um, <clears throat> yeah, on the competitor side, you know, your top 2% is going to make it professional, but, you know, you, you have a whole industry around this. Uh, and it's the biggest form of entertainment in the world. Um, and so it's not going anywhere, no time soon. And so you're probably going to see different variations of it, but it's not going anywhere. And so I think once we expose parents to that, uh, and kind of get them out that mindset of traditional sports where, you know, I think we put our youth in traditional sports because, you know, they they learn hard and soft skills and it's a full pipeline and you're able to see it and it's been there for years, uh, even decades, right? Multiple decades. Um, but, you know, we can't really point to that uh, in esports and show them a real track. So it's up to us as educators so pretty much educate the parents and educate the community. And it, it looks different in every community, right? Um, and so we just got to be careful with programming and we got to make sure we, 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 we set the bar as far as, hey, it's not just about playing a video game. It's not just about winning or hiking up that, you know, that state trophy or community trophy. It's, it's, it's much bigger than that. It's a much um, bigger uh, ecosystem and it's a, it's a lot at stake. Uh, if we don't start educating within STEM, like you said, Katrina, and exposing them to the possibilities. You got it. And, you know, so Glenn, kind of going off of that, how did you address parents or what do you think are the best kind of uh, tactics or procedures uh, to address parents? Now, Chris brought up a great point, and I love the reflection piece that he did, you know, talking about what he could do differently. So I really appreciated your authenticity there. Um, I remember being one of the first school districts in New Jersey to be a um, bring your own device. And it was like letting kids use a cell phone or a tablet or whatever it may be in fifth to eighth grade. Um, and that was educating the parents. That was educating the school board. I was educating the superintendent. That was... Because, you know, to Chris's point, there have been other activities that people have done for years. And I, I always equate it to driving a car. You know, you learned how to drive a car because probably your mom or your dad or somebody of a loved one taught you. No one taught us generation how to use the cell phone. You know, no one taught us how to use the social media. So for us, it was like, all right, we can either push it to the side and say we don't use this here. Or we can, you know, properly show them how it can be done. Um, because that's the world they live in, not the world that we teach what we used to do, no, it's what they're going to go to. Um, and to, you know, to Chris's point, I, you know, there's going to be critics out there. There's going to be people that will chirp along the way, but people don't remember the critics, you know, and it's like Winston Churchill said, if you stop and throw a stone at every dog that barked, you'd never got, never get to where you want to go. So, you know, you got to be passionate. You got to be bold in your, your vision to move that forward. But you also got to celebrate it too, you know. Like Chris mentioned, the athletic programs, like there are programs that have been trophies have been sitting in the trophy case since like 1955, and they're you know covering cobwebs. But the parents are proud of that, mm -hmm. and the grandparents are proud of that. You know, esports is so new, you don't have any trophies up there yet. You know, so for us, it was like you know when we won an event, we were advertising, we put it on Twitch, you know, because we knew we couldn't have parents in the building when they were first really good into gaming. Mm -hmm pandemic so we wanted to make sure they could get connected some way and then when we built the arena we built an area for parents to be able to watch into the gaming if they wanted to come so and like i said we had some critics along the way oh it's just the gamers but once we put out there that we were in the state finals 
you know, that we were competing against high school teams as in a middle school, the community is like, what in the world is going on here? Like, this is pretty cool. I had people randomly coming up to me and say, hey, good luck this weekend to your team that may or may not have supported us before that. I don't know. But the fact that it was out there and we were representing our community on a larger scale, you know, to Chris's point, yeah, like we put it out there nationally or internationally on Twitch and, and YouTube and, you know, all these other platforms that we have. But once the parents start gathering information that we were representing proudly and we're going to the state finals, anybody here's state finals, their ears perk up and they think about what they grew up with generation wise. So they get all excited about that. But then I think it's also selling the message, you know, selling that message each and every day and building that into programs. So for us, like, you know, we built a TV studio the last year and a half, you know, and really got kids involved more than ever with the YouTube channel. And they're making all these different promotional videos now for a fourth that go every day and they broadcast out to the entire international world. But we started highlighting our gamers. You know, we started talking about what this new arena looked like, why you should get involved. And the parents saw that. And we took pictures and we sent it to the local newspaper. So we try to celebrate the kids as much as possible. Because like you said, that's what it's all about. It's about the kids. You know, if we listened to every critic, we would get nothing done. And these kids would have nothing of opportunities and still be lost. You know, let's think about that for a minute. It really goes back to that picture you showed in the very beginning of that gentleman in the back you think that was professor or whatever it may be, that individual had, you know, the ability or the vision and the boldness to move that forward. You know, that's not easy for leaders to do, but that's when you see who a real leader is, that they believe in something for the kids. Because I always say it, you're in it for your kids. And if it wasn't for kids, you wouldn't have a job. So, you know, give them that space, give them that opportunity and celebrate them and make your community proud every step of the way. Gave me chills. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. Um, you know, something that, um, too, that I think about so often is, you know, I grew up involved in, in music. In fact, I started as a music major. Um, that's how involved I was. And, and, you know, so often I see students that aren't involved in traditional sports, aren't involved in music, aren't in art or theater, or, you know, one of those areas. And I have found that esports has been a place for students that didn't have another place to be. They kind of found their people and found their place. And are, are those things that both of you are seeing as well? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, like to give you an example, when we went to the state finals and esports does it, I'm sorry, our league does it where they go to different universities. I have fifth, sixth, seventh graders going up to universities two hours away in our state that had never been to a college before. And like the Christmas part, they saw an arena. It was a multi-million dollar operation that was amazing. And they were realizing they could actually go for an education now. They could do something that they wanted to do that would be a home for them while getting an education and a collegiate degree. You know, that's the part I look at that gives them that opportunity. It's not just a space for them to be them in our school, but it's also the future, whether it's in law, Chris's school, or whether it's in something else, it's giving them that future and seeing that there are things out there for them that are much grander than just your school alone. Yeah, I echo Glenn. I mean, you know, I, I'm thinking about a few students and my youngest daughter, she's a, she's a gamer. I can remember uh, it was less than probably 12 hours of, of uh, us opening the arena that we have now. And uh, she was sitting on the sofa and we probably was there, probably it might have been midnight, not a good dad move before school, right? Um, but she looked at me and she was like, you know, dad, I might, I might stay because we have this room now. Uh, or, you know, uh, one of my students, Nolan, he just graduated the, from the undergraduate campus. And he said one of his main reasons for enrolling into law school was because of the esports program. And so I have many stories like that. And so when you're talking about, you know, a community within one, uh, esports is that, you know, I think, you know, I tell people all the time, besides food, I think gaming and esports is probably the only, you know, co biggest connector other than us enjoying food together. And it's it's something to see. It's something to to, to witness. It's something to grow with and, and listen to students grow. Um, and like I said, it's it's just a wonderful thing to have on any any, any campus. 
uh, whether you're higher ed or K through 12. Yeah, and I think it, it ties into that they can continue the conversations as they grow. You know, whether they're on Discord or some other type of communication, you know, that's a place for them to go to have their conversations and grow with. I, I think about one of ours, um, he really wasn't much of a gamer, but he was got interested in the in the tricasting and got interested in the announcing of it. And then he really grew up in, into our TV program. And his mom said, now that's the field he wants to go into now, which is, you know, journalism and then uh, communications and or, you know, be on TV and, and having those conversations. But to see a seventh thing going to the eighth grade kid, um, going up to random adults when we take them to different um, conferences that we host. So usually when people speak at a conference, you hear people talk and they're usually the adults. I love taking the kids with us and them showcasing the great things we're doing. But then it gets them to have a conversation saying, you know, Chris, why do you do this? And how do you do that? That's eighth grade. Right. I remember when I was in eighth grade, I wasn't having that conversation mm -hmm. with an adult. Well, yeah. I didn't even know what a tricaster was in eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, there's so many opportunities and so much collegiality and so much, you know, brotherhood, sisterhood, whatever you want to call it, with them working mm -hmm. together to something bigger and better in life. Absolutely. Um, so we are, and thank you both so much uh, for sharing that information. Uh, we are about six minutes uh, to the hour, and I do want to open up our uh, conversation here to questions. So if you do have a question and you're on in the audience, uh, please feel free to uh, post in the Q&A or in the chat. It looks like we're, we're uh, chatting away over here. So we do have one question actually for Glenn. Um, Glenn, how did you choose the vendor partners? Um, you know, or who did you partner with or choose to partner with in creating your arena? Yeah, so, um, you know, to Chris's point, you do your research. So for me, it was going online. And I said, you know, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm seeing universities, I'm seeing high schools that are already doing this. And then for me, it was like, all right, who are the players that are doing this? And can I reach out to them and say, who did you use? And then it goes on to social media, that connectivity was reaching out to individuals such as Katrina and others and saying, how can we build something? What companies do you work with? So I hate to say there is no silver bullet uh, because then you also have to, depending on what your states are, depending on what your budget is, depending on a lot of different paperwork that you have to fill out, um, it's not an easy process. You know, you might need two mm -hmm. or three different bids. You might need all these other things to go into the BA. You have to go into the cell to the school board members. Um, but, you know, research, 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 look around for different schools that already have it, and then call them. Reach out to the coach, reach out to the secretary. Someone's going to get you to somebody that paid that bill and figure it out how they made up that uh, arena or space that you're looking to build. Yeah, and, and in Glenn's case, I think it was uh, who had supply at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh and, man. Yeah, that was a struggle. We, was we, yeah. yeah. We waited a while, but it just because things were delayed in that time period where you couldn't get anything. You know, the chain supply was real. <laughs> yeah, I, I built my cake, to cake take into space too. Yeah. During the same time, uh, yeah, it was it was bad. It was ner I was nervous. I, I thought that we would never open our K through twelve space at all because of the delays. Uh, but I think I think on, on another note, Glenn is absolutely right. I think what I did different. And if you had a skill set, I saw somebody in the chat that's a graphic design teacher, I think, uh, building a deck and telling your story uh, and using all your analytics from social media. I'm talking about from the school account, not your personal, uh, but, but showing who you are as a community, as a school, you know, as a student center organization can, can go a long way. You can get better deals um, for the person that's cutting that check. To, to Glenn's point. And so uh, that's something that we did different during that time. Um, I think the K through 12 room was roughly around $60,000, but my principal only cut a check for 15,000 and that was for computer towers. Uh, so it, it could be done, uh, but you had to you had to be innovative and you had to be uh, creative enough to get it done that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of opportunity around 
you know, partnerships with uh, local businesses or yeah. grants or, you know, it does, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of organization and a, a lot of um, cooperation to build that. And I think that's a beautiful example of, you know, this $60,000 to 15. So it, it can be done, like Chris said. So I love that. So as we close out today, I definitely want everyone to know how to get a hold of both of you. So, and how to see the abyss. How do we see it? Glenn, where can we go? <laughs> okay, so uh, you can follow me at Glenn R1809, G-L-E-N-N-R-1809 on uh, a lot of different social media feeds. You can also follow Brig Schools on the social media. And then on Twitch, we are, uh, I believe we're BCS Megs or Megalodon. So uh, Katrina, I'll give that to you and then you can blast that out there, everybody as well. Um, but yeah, just Google us too. We're out there um, and we're really proud of what we're doing here. As you should be. It's it's absolutely incredible. And Chris, how do we find you? Uh, I'm a simple guy. Uh, so LinkedIn <laughs> is, is Christopher Turner. Uh, and Twitter is my other social. Uh, it's Go Clay ES. It's uh, the, the Louisiana way. It's G-E-A-U-X Clay ES. Um, and then you can follow Southern University on any any platform uh, that's out there. YouTube, Twitch, um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, the 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 Lawson is everywhere. I love it. Well, thank you so much. I have no idea. Yeah. It's it's such an honor to to talk with both of you and just to get to hear your stories and and the progression from you know, some of our earliest years on into to the collegiate side of things and, you know, really how we can appreciate esports and really what it's bringing to the lives of students. It's just amazing. So thank you all so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. We will make sure that this is available to uh, share out to anyone. Uh, maybe you have to take it to your board of education uh, and have them hear the webinar and understand a little bit more. So this will be available to you. So thank you both so much. And I hope you have a wonderful week. And uh, if I don't talk to you before, then a wonderful start to your new school year. Thank you.